Hi, I'm Mike McDonald from Huawei Technologies. Welcome to part one of this course on 5G. In this series, we will learn what 5G is, how 5G standards are set, the importance of spectrum, and how modern 5G network architecture differs from previous generations. We will also discuss health concerns. Once fully deployed, 5G networks will provide unprecedented levels of connectivity. But already with 4G, we become used to being online at all times. Checking directions, keeping up with friends, ordering food from an app, just grab the smartphone. But how do we get here? Mobile phones have been around for only 40 years or so. Before, you reached out to someone by dialing on a fixed landline. It did the job, but it had limitations. Chatting was literally a chat. You could only use a phone for talking. And because the lines were fixed, you were unreachable if you were on the move. Then came the 70s. Platform shoes, colorful clothes, disco music, and a whole lot of freedom. The US firm Bell Labs, an R&D subsidiary of AT&T that's now part of Nokia, freed telephones from landlines when it introduced the idea of cellular networks. Welcome to 1G. In cellular networks, coverage areas are divided into cells. Each cell has a radio base station providing signal coverage that enables connections between a mobile phone and an operator's fixed network. The world's first commercial cellular network was launched in Tokyo in 1979 by Nippon Telegraph and Telephone, or NTT. It was based on a standard called Advanced Mobile Phone System, or AMPS. In Europe, the first cell network used was the Nordic Mobile Telephone Standard. It was set up in 1981 in Scandinavian countries. In the US, Chicago was the first city to provide cell phone coverage in 1983. The network also used AMP standard, but not quite the same as the one deployed in Japan. With 1G, users could be reached while on the move, but there was room for improvement. With top speeds of 2.4 kilobits per second, 1G only supported voice calls. 1G was entirely analog, meaning that calls connected like radio signals. Sound quality was subject to interference, and it was hard to guard against unauthorized eavesdropping. Calling was also expensive, and battery life was short. And the devices were really bulky. The first Japanese mobiles were shoulder phones weighing three kilograms. Yet despite all this, early mobile phones were status symbols. If you had one, you must have been special. Mobile phones went digital in the late 80s. Enter the 2G era. Aside from voice calls, 2G had two key features. One, it offered a 160 character short message service, or SMS. Two, it had a low speed data transfer service known as MMS, or multimedia messaging. With these two features, instant messaging was born. This is either a blessing or a curse, depending on... Ah, sorry, should have silenced my phone. But as with 1G, 2G standards weren't united. Europe deployed GSM mobile networks, while the US and a few other countries went with CDMA. Japan, meanwhile, turned to a technology called PDC for its 2G services. Throughout the 1990s, the number of internet users boomed as more and more homes and businesses got either dial-up or ADSL connections. Around the year 2000, 3G appeared. It offered one megabit per second data connectivity. This made online access possible while on the move. With 3G, the mobile industry moved decisively towards interoperability. 3G wasn't a unified global standard, but at least it was based on compatible versions of CDMA technology. It wasn't always easy to get online access while traveling, but with a few exceptions like Japan and South Korea, travelers could use the same handset to make or receive calls on different continents. It's during the 3G era that smartphones with color screens became common, and database services like mobile banking, movie ticketing, and social media began to multiply. Around 2009, global standards were fully united by LTE technology, or long-term evolution, when 3G gave way to 4G. 
Instead of CDMA, LTE implemented a new architecture that allowed data rates of about 100 megabits per second. Now you could enjoy voice, text, high resolution images, and high definition video services. In 2011, the Standard Setting Organization Third Generation Partnership Project, or 3GPP, approved LTE Advanced, a technology that boosted data transfer speeds by 10 times to 1 gigabits per second. LTE-A is also called 4.5G because it's somewhere between 4G and 5G. In fact, wireless technology generations tend to advance in half steps. Between 2G and 3G, there was a standard called GPRS that was referred to as 2.5G. And between 3G and 4G, a technology called High Speed Downlink Packet Access, or 3.5G, boosted data rates while lowering latency. And now we're in the early days of the 5G era. What are the big changes from 4G? Or should I say 4.5G? Well, an obvious capability is more bandwidth. 5G offers up to 20 gigabits per second. To give a sense of scale, downloading a 4K movie takes a few seconds on a 5G phone, compared with 5 to 10 minutes in 4G. 5G provides more reliable connections and nearly instantaneous network response. It can be deployed in latency-critical applications like remote controlling heavy machinery. And 5G has such for fast response times, if you lose in an online game, you can't blame a slow internet. Well, that was five generations of mobile standards across five decades. I hope you enjoyed this brief history of wireless communications. In the next episode, we'll look at our rising expectations of what wireless networks should deliver and how 5G will meet those needs.